When someone talks to James, he doesn't just hear the words, he also tastes them. I have a problem with the name Derek, for instance, which is it's horrible. It's um, earwax. John sees colours when he hears numbers. They're just like flashing colours. For example, one will be a, a whitish colour and two will be an orangey colour. And Heather is able to make quick calculations because she literally sees her numbers around her. I've got naught in front of me here, then I have naught to ten, and then ten to twenty in an L shape, then twenty to thirty, and that's all on a plane. They all have a bizarre condition called synesthesia, in which their senses are joined up. For a long time, no one took people like them seriously. But now it turns out, they're not so different from the rest of us. And their condition may even help explain how we made that great evolutionary leap to develop language. Latham has an extraordinarily colourful way of seeing the world. A world in which colours just jump out at her. They're triggered when she sees letters and numbers. Manning tree is quite a mid-green because of the big M at the beginning and my M is mid-green. Norwich is a bright yellow word because my ends are bright yellow. The reality of it is white on blue, but the images of the riot of colour are in my mind. And it's not just written words that produce this experience. Spoken words have an even more curious effect. Platform 12 is the delayed 12.03 from Braintree. The delayed I see the words spelled out letter by letter on a sort of ticker tape in front of my forehead here and I do see the letters in colour, in my colours. Of course, Dorothy knows the colours aren't really there. These colours are triggered by the intermingling of her senses of vision and hearing. It's a condition called synesthesia. I imagined everybody would be exactly the same until I spoke to school friends about it when I was about ten and they said, you're imagining it and you're a weirdo and so I shut up about it and kept quiet. Adding colours to other senses is the most common form of synesthesia. But it can get a lot stranger. Running this pub can get very confusing for James Wanerton. He has an unusual form of the condition, which means that he doesn't just hear words, he also tastes them. I see a customer, if I know his name, I instantly get the, the taste of his name. There's somebody that comes in here that tastes of wet nappies. <laughs> um, but it isn't that strong. I mean, it's not nice, and it doesn't sound very nice, but it's not that strong a flavour, therefore it doesn't affect me as, as much as, say, Derek would. I mean, Derek, I don't find Derek offensive because it's earwax, but because it's very, very strong. James has no control over which taste is linked with which word. The problems I have are, I mean, somebody will come in, they then order, say, a pint of that. I get the bacon rind taste. They then order a packet of roasted nuts. Uh, I don't get roasted nuts, I get some sort of peculiar burnt meat taste. 
They then pay with a fiver <laughs> from which I get a taste of strawberry jam sandwiches. Very, very specific. I then have to give them the change. Um, change invariably tastes of processed cheese, cheesy taste. In everyday conversation, he is bombarded with flavours. His synesthesia can even set off a battle between real flavours and the ones that are triggered by words. Somebody says something to me, they're talking to me. I can be doing this, but whatever they've said, I'll get the flavour. The flavour will come in and it'll... I'm sitting here listening to... to or tasting flavours while looking at this, smelling... Then it's... It's the conflict. So somebody's saying, do you like this? And then like, I get a strong taste of yoghurt. I, I, I find it very difficult to sit there preparing sausages and bacon and eggs when I'm, I'm getting yoghurt and chocolate taste and everything over the top of me. It makes me feel horrible. So what would work well for you if you had to spend more time in the kitchen? No, I'm getting confused though, all these smells and stuff. Yeah. Good. <laughs> Do you want to go get a breath of breath fresh air? Would that be all right? Actually, yeah, of course it's all right. Yeah, it's just all the smells. No, it's fine, yeah, just go take a I can't get, can't get these out of my head. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Sorry. <laughs> for decades, synesthesia baffled the scientific community, and no one could quite believe it was real. For a while, hallucinogenic drugs were blamed, especially in the 1960s. Some put it down to an overactive imagination. Others thought it was caused by associations from childhood that had survived into later life. In the end, no one could find out what was causing it. So synesthesia was placed in the same scientific category as seances and spoon bending. But Professor V.S. Ramachandran thought it should be taken more seriously. He's one of the world's leading brain researchers. And at the University of California, San Diego, he devised an experiment to test whether synesthesia was real or not. We decided to invent what you might loosely call a clinical test for synesthesia, a way of finding out whether somebody is genuinely experiencing the color, literally seeing the colors when confronted with certain numbers, or whether they're just making it up, or just it's crazy maybe. Take a seat. Simple experiment. Uh, just look at this display, and what do you see there? The volunteers were shown displays in which one letter of the alphabet was arranged in a simple shape. And then two other letters were added at random to make a confusing picture. They only had a short time to see if they could spot the hidden shape. Do you see uh, any shape? No. No. No, okay. No. No. No, okay. Saw a uh, square. That time it looked like a triangle. When you're viewing this, what was your internal subjective experience? Well, I see a, a field of, of letters, um, you know, different colors, and uh, a red triangle would pop out, or a red rectangle or something, um, and I would just see it. According to Professor Ramachandran, Jeff had to be a synesthete. The only way he could see the hidden shape so quickly was if the letters appeared to him as colored. This suggests that in fact he's not crazy, he's literally seeing those numbers tinged with color. This was the first clear-cut evidence that synesthesia is an authentic early sensory process and it's probably caused somewhere in the sensory pathways in the brain evoking the actual perception of the color. So synesthesia was real, not a trick of the memory or imagination. It sparked a new search for what could be causing it. One of the clues lies with people like Dorothy Latham. Seeing colors 
runs in the family. This uh, rather darkish blue is the colour of B in my own particular coloured alphabet. A is a slightly paler yellow. Also, August would be around its colour as well. The pink is like my P. And also, number seven is this shade of pink. Not only does her brother Peter have colour synesthesia, but so does Peter's son. Well, there's some strong colours up there. Shall we go back up to where the colours are stronger? I think it's pretty clear that it is genetically influenced. It certainly runs um, in families very consistently. It's probably as much influenced by genetic disposition uh, as conditions like schizophrenia and, uh, and autism and dyslexia, for instance. Neither of these colours are represented in my alphabet. The mauve would stand for V, which would be a dark purple, and also lighter, but not as light as this, Thursday. But Dorothy and Peter don't always see the same letters as the same colours. There's a strong red down here. Oh, yes. Well, that's we my O colour. Oh, strong that's, red. That's interesting. That's more my R colour and Z. This one's quite good because it's got the... The fact that even in families, each synesthete is affected differently suggests that synesthesia is not caused by a simple genetic mechanism. It's probably only about 70% influenced by, by genes. So there must be environmental influences that determine whether you're actually going to become synesthetic or, or not. I didn't think we did have any similarities, but suddenly we've discovered a couple already. But we've also hit on loads that are different. Having established a genetic link, scientists have now set out to discover what environmental influences might be shaping each person's synesthesia. Clues to those environmental influences might come from the mind of James Wanerton and from his ability to taste words. Covent Garden, it's um, chocolate, crinkly chocolate. Edgware Rose is um, it's a sausage flavour, a very slight sausage flavour. Russell Square, it's celery with toffee. Today, he's on his way to take part in a research project which will look for any experiences in his life that might have shaped these bizarre associations. Quite nice, though. It's like a, a melted, melted fruit gum. Dr. Jamie Ward is a neuropsychologist who's been studying James for the past two years. He's found that James consistently links the same words with the same tastes. Now he wants to discover if there's a pattern to those links which may explain how they were first formed. Thanks for coming in today, James. Mm -hmm. What I'd like to go through with you is um, the particular taste that you get in response to some words. So I'm just going to read aloud some words, and if you just describe to me the best you can any taste that you might get for them. Is okay. that okay? Yeah, fine. Uh, let's start with the word might. I get a strong marmite flavour. What about the word wipe? Wipe, that's marmite again. Okay. It's very weak. So it's different from the other marmite taste, but it's still right. marmite. It's right, so what you're saying is that both the word might and wipe mm. have the taste of marmite. They do, yeah. Okay, well that's interesting, because both of these words obviously have particular sounds in common. So let's try another word that uh, sounds similar. What about the word light? Yeah, that's marmite again, um, with lots of butter this time. What's really interesting about this is that it suggests that there's a structure to his synesthesia. And it's not just arbitrary associations between words and tastes, but there is in fact a structure and a shape to this, which might tell us a little bit about how it's come about and about how it's actually wired in. But Dr. Ward has also noticed another pattern, which may explain how James's connections between words and tastes might have begun. OK, let's try another word. What about seven? Simps nice, that, and it's, um, it tastes like, well, the only way I can articulate it is it tastes like spangles, which are sweets, spangles sweets, but I mean, I haven't had one of those in years. 
but it's a sweet you know, I, I used to have as a child. That's interesting because it suggests that some of your taste experiences are not for things that you're currently eating in your diet, they're for things that you used to eat before. Mm. Yeah. Dr. Ward has found that James's synesthetic tastes are from his childhood. There are no associations with foods from later in his life, like olives or curry. A lot of those flavours I've noticed are sort of things like tin carrots and processed peas and... Right. Must have had a pretty awful diet, wasn't it? Yes. So what's perhaps happened in James is that in his childhood, during the process of vocabulary acquisition, there's kind of been a chaining between the sounds of words with the sounds of the names of food, going back down to the actual concrete experience of tasting that food. What James shows is that childhood experience must be a vital environmental influence in shaping his synesthesia. Having established this, scientists wanted to go a step further to find out what was happening inside a synesthete's brain. Hunting light. Ready. Hunting. One. Out. Two. Out. Important insights have come from studying John Forward. Four. Out. He sees colours that are triggered by spoken words. They're just like flashing colours. For example, one will be a, a whitish colour. One out. Two will be an orangey colour. Two out. Three out. Four and five are sort of r reddish colours. Four out. But for John, out. not all words produce colours. From childhood, his only coloured words have been ones that fit into sequences, like numbers, or days of the week, or months of the year. I think as, as soon as I started to be aware of things that needed to be ordered, I started to attach colours and, uh, and spatial attributes to them. What is remarkable is that John is able to see these colours at all, because for all his adult life, he's been blind. It's a nice thing to have because it, it enables you to be able to distinguish things one from another. Uh, you can distinguish Saturday from Sunday because they've got different colours. Because he is blind, John's synesthesia cannot possibly be influenced by any signal from his eyes. So he's an ideal person to study. His very real sense of seeing colours can only be triggered by something inside his brain. Okay, keep your head nice and still. Yep. Okay. Megan Stephen of Oxford University is conducting an experiment to discover what is happening inside John's brain when he sees his thin aesthetic colours. The scanner will show which parts of his brain are activated when he hears words. Yeah. Now I'm going to head outside, okay? okay. Yeah. All right. Okay, John, we're going to do the first experiment now. Um, what I'd like you to do... First, she studies his brain activity when he listens to words that don't give him colours. Master. Like. Exquisite. Society. More. Okay, John, how did that go? Okay, yeah. Neuroscientists have discovered that our different senses seem to be processed in separate areas of our brains. So the vision areas are usually only triggered by signals from the eye. The hearing areas only by signals from the ears. And it's the same with other senses, like touch. If you look at the brain, the anatomy of the brain and how it's organized, look at where the nerve, the obvious nerve bundles go to, it all looks as though the senses are completely separate from each other. You have the eyes connecting through to particular parts of the brain and the ears and then the tongue and so on. They're all very, very separate from each other. As expected, John's brain scan shows activity in his sound processing areas when he listens to these ordinary words. Okay, here we go. But Megan Stephen then reads John a list of words that do trigger his colours. February. April. Saturday. 
Okay, John, well done. Now we're just going to come and see what happens on the screen here. The scan now reveals what it is that is causing his synesthesia. Not only is the sound area of the brain active, but parts of the visual area have been triggered as well. Areas which should only be activated by a signal from the eye. When John hears words like Monday or January, he sees a specific color. And you can see here the area of his brain that lights up when he sees that color. An area of the brain we call V4. It's a visual area. And it's an area that processes information about color. And we also have another area that's lit up at the same time. And that's an area we call V1, another visual area. If a sighted person were to look at red, you would see these same areas of the brain activated. But John, of course, is, is blind, so we know that the only way he could be activating these areas of the brain that process vision and color is through the synesthesia. So synesthesia is caused by the creation of special working connections between areas of the brain which are normally quite separate. That, I think, must mean that particular groups of nerve cells are becoming connected, functionally somehow, connected together with each other. So one, when one group of nerve cells fires off, then another bunch, somewhere else, maybe a long way away in the brain, very specifically, fires off together with it. And you get these conjunctions of, of sensation. Well done, John. This is really interesting. It makes me confident that I'm not actually making this up. We've got hard proof now. You can tell your wife that you weren't kidding all along. <laughs> So it is these extra connections within the brains of synesthetes which create for them the sense of a strange world that doesn't really exist. However, recent discoveries suggest that synesthesia may not be so unusual after all. It may be something we all have. summer long, a secret experiment was underway at the Science Museum in London. Well, it's a very exciting project because we've come here to test over a thousand members of the general population. So we've kind of taken the science out of the lab, and what we're trying to find out is just how common is synesthesia. So basically, you're going to see a letter number on the screen here, and we want you to choose the best colour that goes with it. So how you do that is up to you. There's no right or wrong answer, so just go with your instinct. All right. The public didn't know they were being tested for synesthesia. They also didn't know that after they'd done the test once, they would be asked to repeat it. Synesthetes should consistently link the same colours to the same letters and numbers in both parts of the experiment. Non-synesthetes should be less consistent as they are using guesswork. What we find is that the scores of people who don't have synesthesia normally lie between zero and 50% consistent. Whereas people with synesthesia, when they're asked to choose the best color, are normally between 80 and 100% consistent. The results show that nearly one in a hundred of us have this form of synesthesia. So there could be as many as half a million people in Britain who see coloured letters and numbers. It suggests that if you start asking your friends and your relatives that it's not beyond the realms of possibility that you will soon find somebody who is a synesthete. It might be somebody who you've gone to the pub with every week and all of a sudden you say, you know, do you think about A as being coloured? Do you think about 5 as being coloured? And they'll say, yes, of course I do. You know, everybody does. Well, not everybody does, but it is still quite common. And you haven't got to look too far in order to find it. Jamie Ward's experiment has revealed a massive, hidden population of synesthetes. But he's gone on to make an even more startling discovery. Synesthesia might be a condition that affects all of us. The discovery came when he began a study involving Dorothy Latham. Dorothy doesn't just see colours when she hears spoken words. 
She also sees colours when she listens to music. As I play the notes from low notes through middle to high, the colours change for each note in slight gradations and they go from the purples and blacks and dark browns through greens and mid-browns to bright colours like yellow and white. So as I play, these colours will be changing in my mind. What we were keen to find out with Dorothy was whether or not it was just a simple random association of colours with notes or whether there was an underlying logic. What we did with Dorothy is we presented her with a whole series of notes over three octaves in a random order. For each of the notes we presented her with a colour palette of a wide range of colours and asked her to choose the best colour that goes with that particular note. And we got some amazing results. So what you can see here is that for the low pitch notes, we've got these darker purple and brown colours. And as we move further up, we get oranges and yellows. And right at the top end, it's more white. So we've got this amazing pattern going from dark to light. What this suggests is that there is some organising principle which dictates how particular musical notes become associated with particular colours. But the big surprise came when he repeated the experiment with a control group of non-synesthetes. This is what we found for a typical control subject. So differently from Dorothy's, you haven't got a gradual transition from one colour to the other. But nevertheless, you can discern some kind of trend where there are darker colours for the low pitch notes and much lighter colours for the high pitch notes. What our results suggest is that beneath the surface, we all have mechanisms that link together sound and vision, and the mechanisms seem to be pretty much the same in both synesthetes and other members of the population. So we're all, in a way, synesthetes, even if we don't realise it. Our senses of vision and hearing are linked together within our brains. It's just that some people experience a more exaggerated version. What's really extraordinary about synesthetes is that they have the experiences. They have the experiences as strongly and vividly and, uh, and genuinely uh, as, as your experience of, of looking at me. So it touches on the whole issue of what it is about certain kinds of brain activity that lead to awareness. But if synesthesia is so widespread, it begs the question, why? Can there be some strange evolutionary benefit to human beings in having senses that intermingle? And if so, what could it be? An important clue has come from Heather Burt. Hiya. Oh, I'm all right. It's fantastic. Wow. Heather sees coloured numbers which are arranged in three-dimensional space around her. She has what is known as a number line. I've got naught in front of me here, then I have naught to ten, and then ten to twenty in an L shape, then twenty to thirty, and that's all on a plane, then thirty to forty, which is above, 40 to 50, 50 to 60, and so on in tens, all the way up to 100. And then the block repeats itself exactly up to 200, and so on in blocks, all the way up to 1,000 here. And then it carries on forever. Heather's number line suggests that her synesthesia has an extra dimension. The mechanism that links numbers to colours also seems to connect to the part of her brain that produces a sense of space. Hi, eh? Yeah. Um... It's an aspect of her synesthesia with a real practical benefit. You can have three rolls as well, please. Brown rolls, yeah. It helps with her maths. Got three left. By moving around her number line, 
she's able to calculate her change. Thank you very much. Cheers. This is difficult for me to imagine anyone else doing maths in another way, as it probably is for you to work out how I do it with my visual thing, because it's the only way that I know. And she's not alone in having a number line. John Fullwood also sees numbers in space. He sees days of the week, months of the year, and years themselves around him, including the year of his birth. From where I'm sitting, um, it's <laughs> back there. <laughs> what, what, it was 1949 back there? Uh, yes, yes. And where's 2004? Well, uh, 2004 is where, where I am now. Um, and what about 2020? Oh, that's over there. Jamie Ward decided to find out just how common this ability to work with numbers by arranging them in space was among synesthetes. He found it was widespread. Lots of synesthetes said that they had number lines in which numbers were arranged out in space. And this was very exciting because it was as many as 60% of people who have coloured numbers also see numbers being arranged in space, which is a huge percentage of the synesthetic population. But the true revelation came when he ran an experiment with a group of non-synesthetes. One experiment involves showing uh, numbers on a computer screen. And what people have to do is make a decision about those numbers with their left and their right hand. So, for example, they might judge whether a number is odd or even. And what we find is that people are faster at responding to small numbers such as one or two with their left hand and faster at responding to larger numbers such as eight or nine with their right hand. So it appears as if we all have a number line that runs from one on the left through to nine and so on on the right hand side. So it seems we all have a sense of numbers arranged in space. These number lines suggest to Dr. Ward a reason why synesthesia might exist in the human population. One clue for why synesthesia might survive is that it enables us to deal with abstract concepts such as numbers and other sequences in a very concrete way using our senses. What we do is we actually put these sequences into a spatial arrangement and this seems to be common to each and every one of us. But it's something that synesthetes are very aware of but most of us are not aware of. Yeah, hi mate, yeah, hi. So synesthesia may be a more extreme form of something we've all had to develop. Have you got the table, yeah? What, six people? No, no, you need to make it more. About eight? 30 to 40. Synesthesia could be a manifestation of how we have learned to work with abstract concepts, to manipulate numbers and ideas. Something that has defined our species and helped shape our civilization. And some scientists go even further. They think synesthesia may help explain another critical skill that defines us as human. Our creativity. This idea was developed when one scientist began to wonder about the genetics of synesthesia. What purpose did these genes actually serve? Very often in biology, when you find a gene that doesn't have an apparent function, a non-functional gene, there's usually a hidden agenda. So what might the hidden agenda be in the case of synesthesia? Why is it so widely prevalent? When he looked for answers, one thing in particular struck him. The clue comes from the fact that synesthesia is eight times more common among artists, poets and novelists than in the general population. He began to develop a daring theory. Could synesthesia help explain creativity? He started to look at artists and their influences. Aldborough on the Suffolk coast. The light and landscape here have long attracted artists. Jane Mackay is a painter. 
and the inspiration for her work starts with her synesthesia. The sea is quite complex. It has a velvety beige bit to it. It also, there, just heard that, the of the wave coming down is quite grey and expanding. There's also the sound of the pebbles being pulled back by the sea. It's a sort of bluey grey sort of sound. It is absolute bliss because all I have to do is just listen to some music and I have got so much I want to paint, I can hardly breathe. She's exhibiting paintings that are inspired by an opera by Benjamin Britten, who lived and worked here. The opera is based on a disturbing ghost story, The Turn of the Screw. The purple just appeared almost almost subconsciously here because it, it was the colour of the two main instruments here, which is the alto flute and the bass clarinet. And to me, they were absolutely purple velvet. They couldn't have been anything else. This one is variation one of the opera, and I saw it as this incredibly sharp shaft of coloured light right. rising out of the centre on, on a blue background. It gets more and more dissonant and more and more spooky, really. Yeah. That's why all these sort of jangly shapes came in, almost like cut glass. Many famous artists have been synesthetes, including the jazz legend Miles Davis and the painter Kandinsky. No one believes that synesthesia directly causes creativity, but experiencing one sense in terms of another can be a source of artistic insight. The basis of creativity is seeing unexpected links, sometimes even making seemingly random links and picking the ones which make sense or which are beautiful, whatever that means. This is the basis of all creativity, whether in poetry or in visual art or in literature. Professor Ramachandran was particularly interested in one type of creativity used in everyday speech. Metaphors. Ways of speaking which connect different concepts. He's noticed that these often involve links to the senses. Our language is replete with what we might call synesthetic metaphors, where you're sort of linking different sensory systems in metaphorical usage. As, for example, you say loud shut. My shirt's not making any noise. Why do you call it loud shut? Instantly you understand what I'm talking about. It heightens your appreciation of its vivid color. Whereas when you say cheddar cheese is sharp, obviously cheese isn't sharp if you rub it on your skin, it's soft. Then you say, well, no, 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 I mean it tastes sharp. But there's a circularity here. Why are you using a tactile adjective to describe a taste sensation? Ramachandran believes that this ability to see and express one thing in terms of another is central to the artistic process. Take, for example, Shakespeare. The Globe Theatre in South London. Director Tim Carroll has seen how powerfully Shakespeare's metaphors work on audiences today. Take something like, my heart is turned to stone. We, we know that somehow it isn't really your heart that's doing the feeling, and your heart hasn't really turned to stone, but it's so much more immediate, it's so much more real to us to hear that your heart has turned to stone than if you simply said, my feelings have become rather cold or hardened. 
Many of Shakespeare's metaphors are synesthetic, involving a link to the senses. When Shakespeare uses the expression bitter cold, he's connecting the feeling of coldness, the taste of bitterness, and putting them together. Now, logically, that may not make any sense, but for all of us it works. We feel it's right. But Tim Carroll believes the genius of Shakespeare comes when he goes beyond sense metaphors to ones which involve links to more abstract ideas. One of my favourites is from The Tempest. This music crept by me upon the waters, which brings together an abstract music with something so real as to creep. What kind of animal it is that might creep by Ferdinand upon the waters, we don't know, but it creates an image in our minds which is exciting. I think that use of metaphor may rely on mechanisms similar to those involved in synesthesia. One highly speculative idea is that maybe the same genes which give rise to synesthesia, when expressed more diffusely, make you more prone to make these links across different conceptual realms, therefore make you more creative, more imaginative, make you more prone to metaphor, in other words. He believes that synesthesia and creativity may share a similar genetic basis. An ability to open links within our brains, not only between senses, but also between concepts. If this is so, it's an extraordinary insight. But he thinks synesthesia may explain even more. It may also cast light on one of the most fundamental scientific puzzles of them all. How this started. It's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. The emergence of language has always been an extremely controversial topic. The ladies not for turning. I did not have sexual relations with that woman. How do you start with the grunts and groans and howls of our ape-like ancestors and then evolve all the sophistication of a Shakespeare or a George Bush? This is one of the big puzzles in language. How do you evolve an arbitrary set of symbols to denote objects and events and relationships in the external world? Did our ancestors all sit next to the fireplace and say, Axe! Everybody say Axe after me. Axe! Obviously not. That's not how it got started. But if that didn't happen, how did it get started? He's come to Pacific Beach in California to test his theory on how language might have started. He believes that our common synesthetic ability to link sounds and objects may have been the springboard to language. I'm going to do a simple experiment right here on the beach to test this. We're going to take two shapes, one of which is kind of round and the other is sort of jagged. And we're going to give them to people and ask them to tell us which one is a booba, which one is a kiki. These are just nonsense words. And we're going to see if there is any non-random correspondence between one shape and one sound. One of them is booba, the other is kiki. Which is which? Booba is kiki. This is kiki, this is booba. I think that's booba and that's kiki. Which is which? That's a kiki and that's a booba. You sure? Pretty sure. I say booba. This is booba? Yeah. This one is kiki? Yeah. Why do you say that? I don't know. It just looks like a booba. Thank you. <laughs> booba and kiki. Well, when we showed people these shapes and said one of them is booba, the other is kiki, I would tell me which is which. Majority of them, 90, 95% of them, spontaneously said that's a booba, that's a kiki, without even thinking about it. Kiki. Yeah. Booba. Kiki, booba. This one's booba and this one's kiki. Excellent. Very good. This means there is a non-arbitrary correspondence, a spontaneous tendency in all of us to pick the bulbous amoeboid shape as the booba. So the gentle undulation of the sound contour represented in the hearing center in your brain mimics the gentle undulation of the visual contour. Similarly, ki ki has a sharp edge to it, sharp sound, and that's mimicking the sharp inflection of the visual contour of the ki ki. And this is what you need, this initial bias is what you need to get the first words going. Ramachandran believes this synesthetic connection between our senses of hearing and vision was an important initial step 
towards the creation of words. Our earliest ancestors first started to talk by using sounds that actually evoke the object that they wish to describe. But that was only part of the process. He found that there was a cascade of other links in our brains which reinforced this tendency. Just as you have synesthesia between sensory areas, you also have a propensity to mimic hand movements with lip and tongue movements. And this is probably because the hand and the mouth area are right next to each other in the brain, and there is some cross-activation of the kind you see in synesthesia. What I'm claiming is that there's a non-arbitrary mapping between the hand gestures and unconscious lip and tongue movements. For example, un peu, diminutive, tinuini, chinna in, in Indian language, versus enormous, large, where the lips actually mimic what the fingers are doing. And I don't think that's a coincidence. If he's right, then language emerged from a multitude of synesthetic connections within our brains. We've got several types of interaction in place, but we can see how in evolution, all of these acting in conjunction start bootstrapping each other and enhancing each other, resulting in the whole avalanche that we call language. Ah, this is not the end. Uh, it is not even the beginning of the end, uh, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. Synesthesia is a truly strange phenomenon. But most synesthetes enjoy having their senses intermingled. They wouldn't want to be without it. It's so important to me. It would be like losing a finger or, or, or something. You, you, you would, you, you would feel, feel physically bereft that it, was, um, that, it was, that it had gone. James Wanerton is more ambivalent. His form of synesthesia is often unsettling. Normally there's a lot of information on one of these signs here and I'm reading through, I'm getting the flavours, which means I can't comprehend the exact town names or whatever, or, and then I get totally confused. It's, it's like, that. where am I going? I don't know where I'm going, right, straight ahead, left, I don't know. But given the choice, he wouldn't want to be without it either. I enjoy probably about 10 or 15 percent of this, the rest of it's bad. Given that choice, if they could say, look, it's only going to be the synesthesia we take away, you will no longer taste words, what would no, you say? No, 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 I've, I've thought about it there, no, I wouldn't want them to. No, I couldn't. I'm just terrified of what it takes with it. Today, synesthesia is no longer regarded simply as a bizarre or rare condition. It may now be opening a window into our greatest mysteries and some of our greatest achievements. Right.